Hi, it's Katrina. Are you ready for a journey into the dark side of history? Today, we are diving deep into the most disturbing and mind-blowing discoveries ever made. From a woman without a face to a glimpse into a living hell, these revelations will leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. Prepare to be shocked, terrified, and forever changed. Too many bones in the forest. Something beyond chilling was discovered at an undisclosed dig site deep in the quiet forests of Poland. Archaeologists are keeping the site a secret. One, because the discovery is so disturbing. And two, because they don't want treasure hunters ransacking the place. Twelve burial pits were unearthed dating back to the first century BC, so 2,000 years ago. Not just burial pits, but weird urns filled with the cremated remains of long-dead warriors. There were skeletons and urns all over the place. This was an ancient cemetery used by Germanic tribes. It was discovered near the border of Germany. Historians say this area has been pretty popular over the years. But this is by far one of the strangest funerary rituals that's ever been identified. Finding a pit full of skeletons isn't that weird in a European forest, but the urns are highly unusual. The archaeologists had to get a veterinarian to x-ray the urns and take a look at what's inside. Sure enough, they were full of ashes, likely belonging to Germanic warriors. But something even more terrifying was also discovered in a Polish forest recently. 300 headless skeletons from a much more recent war. Polish researchers carried out an excavation in a dark and muddy forest and found a staggering number of corpses. They have been hiding just below the surface for the last century. When information came to light that the forest contained a mass grave of German prisoners, archaeologists had to investigate. In a controversial twist, these skeletons weren't victims of the Nazis. In fact, they are Nazis. The 300 skeletons belong to German prisoners who were buried by the Soviets. At least that's the ongoing theory. Nobody really knows because the records just aren't there to prove what happened. The skeletons may be from German workers who died while toiling at the explosives factory in a camp nearby. Then there is the whole missing head situation. Many of the skeletons are missing their skulls. Experts don't know if this is the result of grave robbers trying to find treasure and desecrating the bodies, construction work that occurred a few decades ago, or something significantly worse. What did they do to his tongue? 2,000 years ago, a Roman Briton was buried face first in the dirt. But before that happened, his tongue was removed from his head. It's pretty gross, and experts can't make sense of it. They're calling it a unique mutilation. I call it disturbing. The mystery man's tongue had been amputated and replaced with a flat rock. Archaeologists think it may have been because locals feared he would rise from the grave and start biting people. This guy may have been a vampire. The burial site dates to about the 3rd century AD, when the people of England lived in small farming communities. This was Roman-occupied Britain, an official part of the Roman Empire. The date is important because Roman Britain wasn't exactly known for its weird burial rituals. Pre-burial mutations were not common in the empire's territories. This kind of thing hasn't even been identified before in the archaeological record. Experts at Historic England said it's a new practice that nobody's seen before. To understand the grisly mystery, we have to pick apart every detail of the burial, starting with the man's position face down in his grave. This sort of thing was reserved for the despicable members of society. If somebody was odd, aberrant, or threatening, they would be buried face down in the dirt. It was a form of punishment, and also a form of humiliation. The removal of the tongue is a little more difficult to make sense of. One theory is that the man had mental health issues and bit his own tongue off. If that's the case, it's tragic. He may have been shunned by his own community for his differences and given a deviant's burial. Another theory is that his tongue was cut out for spreading malicious slander. Archaeologist Simon Mays said that there are ancient Germanic law codes that involve removing someone's tongue who spreads lies and rumors. It's unclear if there are any Roman laws that were similar, but it is possible. This person could have had their tongue cut out for telling fibs about his neighbors, or maybe truths that his neighbors didn't want anyone to know about. The last unusual detail is the stone that was placed inside of his mouth. It isn't the first time researchers have seen this happen. When the Romans cut someone's head off and buried them, they would sometimes place a pot where their skull should be. They often replaced severed body parts with inanimate objects. 
Maybe so they could be put back together in the afterlife? They weren't complete monsters. What are your thoughts on this stone tongue? Let me know in the comments. The Whistles of Death Scientists have recreated what might just be the scariest sound in the history of sounds. Experts wouldn't have been able to do it without the invention of the 3D printer and some artifacts found in Mexico in the 1990s. Nobody is 100% sure what the Aztec death whistle was for, but there are some thoughts. It may have been used by crazed, drug-smoking shamans during ceremonies in honor of the wind god Ehekat. The shaman may have blown the whistle, emitting a sound like a thousand banshees screeching at once. Then, when the cries of an army of ghosts faded, the blood sacrifices would begin. That's one theory. The other theory is that Aztec death whistles were used by warriors as they went into battle. They may have been a type of psychological warfare, and a pretty effective one at that. If you were part of an army facing off against a host of Aztec soldiers, their faces painted, war clubs in the air, you would have been at least mildly nervous. Then, if a noise like all the screams of hell rolled across the battlefield, you'd go from nervous to terrified. When archaeologists discovered the whistle in 1999, they thought it was a toy. Those thoughts went away when researchers realized the whistle makes a sound like a blood-curdling human scream. Experts decided it wasn't a toy at all. The whistle may have been to help souls transition into the afterlife following a sacrifice. The whistle in 1999 was discovered inside the Temple of Ehegat, clutched in the skeletal hand of a dead man who was sacrificed more than 500 years ago. Here is what the Aztec death whistle sounds like. Fair warning, be careful and make sure your sound isn't turned way up. It's a pretty unnerving sound, right? Imagine this sound multiplied by the hundreds while you hide in the jungle at night trying not to get sacrificed. It's as if the Aztecs figured out how to recreate the most terrifying soul-sucking screech ever, and then they made a whistle out of it for their gods. A Spanish Massacre 2,000 years ago, around the same time that the guy in Britain was having his tongue cut out, a horrific disaster was unfolding in Spain. It was an episode of brutality that researchers at the University of Oxford are trying to wrap their heads around. What they found during a recent excavation in Spain is not for the squeamish, so I'm warning you now, you might want to skip ahead. Archaeologists have completed a full study on 13 skeletons recovered from an ancient settlement known as La Olla. Nine of the skeletons belonged to adults, two were teenagers, one a child, and one an infant. All of them died around the year 365 BC so a little more than 2,000 years ago. What struck the researchers as particularly heinous was the way in which these people died. Some were decapitated, one had their arm ripped off, plus none of them had been buried. And some of the remains even showed evidence of burns. Scientists don't know what happened, only that it was ultra-violent. It's like a horde of angry giants ran through the Iron Age village, pulling people apart at the seams. Not a fun time to be alive. Imagine how awful this scene was, that evidence still remains thousands of years later. Researchers don't know who the victims were or their attackers. All they have said is that the discovery has changed their perception of the Iron Age. It's looking like Europe may have been even more brutal before the Roman Empire took over. Napoleon Soldiers Archaeologists were faced with a grim discovery in Lithuania's capital of Vilnius. As the snow beat down upon them, they painstakingly excavated the partially frozen ground of a mass grave. The archaeologists pulled a jumble of bones from a pit, along with pieces of clothing, random shoes, and buttons. The mass grave is over 200 years old. What they found was terrifying. It was the assortment of buttons in the grave that revealed the identity of the deceased. They were able to trace the buttons back to 40 different regiments from Napoleon Bonaparte's Grand Army. These were men who died in 1812 after Napoleon foolishly tried to take Moscow. As the French army fled Russia, their casualties mounted. This mass grave is full of Napoleon soldiers, but you're not going to believe how horrible their deaths were. I warn you, the stories in today's video might be disturbing to some viewers. Napoleon invaded Russia for many reasons. To create a buffer zone and protect France from future invasion, to weaken Russia and to continue to expand his empire. It all sounded great to him. Easy peasy. 
Napoleon sent 675,000 men into Russia to crush the Tsar, which in his mind were more than enough. Almost none of them returned. It was a disaster. Napoleon's army wasn't just made up of French people. There were also Germans, Spaniards, Italians, Lithuanians, and Poles. As he pushed his army deeper into Russia and the Tsar refused to surrender, the men were faced with a problem. Napoleon and his soldiers were running out of food. Napoleon hadn't anticipated that the Tsar would employ a scorched earth policy, where they destroyed everything possible so that their enemy, Napoleon, couldn't use it. All the crops and towns were burned or destroyed. There was nowhere for the troops to find food or shelter, and winter was coming for real. The original 675,000 men dwindled to only 41,000 soldiers by the time Napoleon reached Smolensk. You might be thinking there is no way the French suffered that many casualties, but they did. Between the launch of the invasion and the retreat, the French lost more than 500,000 soldiers. 300,000 of them were lost due to disease, weather, and starvation. Napoleon fled west with his few surviving troops. They crossed the Berezina River and arrived in Vilnius, where they found nothing to eat. Around 20,000 troops died in the city of things like typhus, hypothermia, and starvation. To get rid of the corpses, they were thrown into mass graves. It was one of these mass graves discovered in the suburb of Vilnius, forcing everyone to remember just how horrible everything used to be. I know the world can feel like a scary place today, but 1812 sucked. The grave contained the corpses of 3,269 people. Bioarchaeologist Rimantas Jankaskas excavated them all in just under a month. Based on the bones, they were all primarily men, but not all of them. Archaeologists identified about two dozen females, though it's unclear what their role was. Maybe nurses or companions, cooks or family members. To get a better idea of the situation, researchers at the University of Central Florida performed oxygen isotope analysis. I don't want to bore you with all the details of the science, but this is surprisingly interesting. By looking at the oxygen isotopes inside the remains, researchers could figure out where the people came from. Oxygen isotopes vary depending on where you live. All around you is oxygen, and it's slightly different depending on factors like humidity, how close to the ocean you are, and where your elevation is. By measuring these inside human bones, scientists can tell exactly where an individual was born. Science is pretty cool. The study revealed that none of the dead people were local to Vilnius. They all appeared to be from Central Europe, with the one woman tested being from the south of France. The isotopes also revealed that the deceased suffered from advanced stages of starvation. But it was worse than that. They had rampant dental cavities, indications of severe stress, and typhus. And now for a quick break, but first, it's shout out time! I want to give a big shout out to Grinder819 and David McRary. Hope you have a great night! Although with this video, I hope you don't have nightmares. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the family. The Woman Without a Face Scientists are trying to figure out why the woman they just discovered in the ruins of a castle is missing her face. It's every bit as shocking as it sounds. In the small village of Eisleben, Germany, archaeologists excavated the ruins of an imperial palace. They found additional ruins from a series of castle fortifications. Near the fortifications, they found human remains. Two skeletons belonging to an elite couple who lived 1,000 years ago. Everything was pretty standard, archaeology-wise, until researchers noticed something horrific. The woman had no facial bones. According to project leader Felix Biermann, the female skeleton's facial bones were all missing. Researchers thought maybe it had something to do with the desecration of the grave, but the grave was never desecrated. Nobody's touched it in a thousand years. The woman must have been buried like that. What in the world happened to her? For all of her bones to be missing from her face, she must have either suffered a major accident or been the victim of something unspeakable. Let's take a closer look at the grave of the guy buried beside her. He was buried with a collection of grave goods, things like a knife, a nice belt, and something called a staff of office. This was a typical status symbol carried by people with a high military rank during the Middle Ages. Alright, so this guy was a military man, and the woman was presumably his partner. Plus, given the proximity of their graves to the medieval castle, they must have both been of high status. Another elite medieval cemetery was found nearby in 2021 and contained around 70 burials. 
But why were these two buried alone? And what the heck happened to her face? I don't know. And neither do the experts. If you have any theories, please let me know in the comments. The Horrors of a Roman Prison You hear about Roman temples being discovered all the time. Roman tombs, palaces, villas, bathhouses, military barracks. But what about prisons? These were terrifying places to be. I mean, no prison is great unless you're in modern-day Sweden, maybe, but ancient Rome? Yikes. In Corinth, Greece, archaeologists just found a piece of ancient Roman history that will make your blood run cold. Archaeologists wouldn't even have known they were dealing with a prison if not for the chilling graffiti found scrawled on the floors and cracks in the wall. Even though historical records show that prisons were a common part of Roman life, few have ever been studied. Now that one's been found, it's so creepy that maybe archaeologists are better off forgetting all about it. Matthew Larson from the University of Copenhagen said prisons existed in almost every Roman town. However, there is almost no evidence of what a Roman prison looked like. Finding them has been harder than finding a needle in a haystack. That makes this new discovery very exciting, but also a little terrifying. Archaeologists also discovered bits and pieces of ancient jugs and lamps inside the ruin. It suggests the prison was dark and dreary. All of these clues point to miserable conditions and what must have felt like endless suffering. A prisoner found on a mountain. During one of the darkest chapters of modern U.S. history, 110,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and put into prison camps. Many Americans never learned about this in school. This was during World War II when everyone was worried about the Nazis. The U.S. government was also worried about Japanese Americans becoming spies, and so they put them in internment camps in the United States. Now the bones of an artist who got sent to the prison for having Japanese heritage have been sent back home to be buried with his family. A hiker enjoying nature in 2019 stumbled on something that no one wants to find. High on the slopes of California's second highest peak, they found the skeletal remains that bore the chilling marks of time. Little did they know, these bones held the secrets of a man who had vanished decades earlier. Gichi Matsumura, a Japanese-American artist, was imprisoned at the Manzanar camp in 1945 along with other people of Japanese descent. There were 10,000 other prisoners at Manzanar, a former farming town located almost 200 miles from Los Angeles. The winters are cold and the summers are hot, and the camp was built 14,000 feet above sea level. The conditions were so poor that men would sneak out of the camp at night to go fishing. During a fishing trip with fellow inmates, Matsumura became separated from the group. He went off to paint by himself and got caught in a freak snowstorm. This was in summer, by the way. Apparently, in the 1940s, California would sometimes have snowstorms in the middle of the summer. About a month after Matsumura was caught in the storm, other hikers found his body. He was buried on the mountain, but the grave wasn't mapped, so his final resting place was forgotten. Over the years, people have gone in search of his missing grave, but none of them ever found it. It's always the people who aren't looking who end up finding these things. The random hiker in 2019 who didn't know the story solved the mystery. Matsumura's body has now been lost once and found twice. What's truly sad is that after Germany surrendered and just days before the atomic bombs were dropped on Japan, the prisoners at Manzanar were finally allowed to leave but only half of them did. While the government was trying to close the camps down, many Japanese citizens refused to go home because they were afraid of the racism and violence on the outside. They thought it was safer to stay in the mountains with their community and support than return to civilization. Many of the people in the camps had had everything taken from them. Their businesses, their homes, their bank accounts, they had nothing to go back to. It's important to note that the decision to remain in the camps was a complex one and hopefully not a decision we ever have to make today. Evidence of an Ancient Conquest Evidence of a conquest that unfolded more than 2,500 years ago has been discovered in Turkey. In the ancient city of Sardis, human remains were found from the Persian invasion of Lydia. That's never a good sign, unless you're an archaeologist. The remains include the skeletons of two soldiers who likely died during an epic military campaign. Nick Cahill from the University of Wisconsin was the leader of the excavation team. He and his colleagues dug up the ruins of Sardis, a city that had once been magnificent. 
Sardis was the shining capital of the Lydian Empire, which itself had been one of the strongest empires the planet has ever seen. Lydia was so rich that Sardis is believed to be the birthplace of gold and silver coins. The people were so wealthy and influential that they pretty much invented money. Not really, but you get the point. Nobody had been using gold coins before them. The Lydians were in control of Anatolia up until 546 BC. That was when legendary Persian ruler Cyrus the Great ended them with extreme prejudice, forever changing the world. The turning point in history was the Battle of Thimbra. The forces of Cyrus the Great faced off against the army of King Croesus of Lydia. Even though the Lydians were rich enough that they could buy as many mercenaries as they wanted, they were still no match for the Persians. They fell, and so did the city of Sardis. And that was it. The Lydian Empire was defeated, and the Achaemenid Empire of Persia was the new world power. Under Persian rule, Anatolia changed. The Persians pushed their cultural influences across the region, destroying cities that had been famous for their splendor. Now, scientists are trying to see what life was like for those soldiers during that time by investigating the two skeletons that they recently found. They have already confirmed the skeletons are of two young male soldiers in their early 20s. Their bones show signs of trauma consistent with sharp weapons. There's no doubt about it. The soldiers met a violent end, likely at the end of a sword. There was also something strange found clutched in the skeletal hand of one of the soldiers. It was a rock which may have been ammunition for a slingshot. The soldier was still holding the stone in his hand 2,500 years after he lost the battle. Nick Cahill said the stone is proof that the soldiers were struck down while actively engaged in a fight. They weren't even buried, but just left for dead in the ruins. The skeletons were found underneath a collapsed brick wall. Scientists think they were left unburied along with thousands of other soldiers in the chaos as the city of Sardis burned. The Skeletons with No Skulls When archaeologists opened a tomb that they recently found in Sweden, they were not surprised at all to see skeletons. But they were surprised when none of the skeletons had any heads. This has turned out to be one of the oldest graves ever found in Scandinavia, and it doesn't have a single skull in it you're not going to believe what else is missing. The grave was found in Tiarp, and like I said, it's old, really old, dating to the early Neolithic period of around 3500 BC. The grave was marked by a huge stone dolmen, one of the most ancient ever found in Northern Europe. It's shocking that no scientists had dug the place up already, seeing as the huge stone monument is so hard to miss. Underneath the dolmen, inside the grave, the skeletons showed no signs of a violent death. It doesn't look like they were involved in a struggle or that they had been massacred. But if that's the case, where did their heads go? The research team, headed by archaeologist Carl Goran Sjögren, said the burial remained untouched since the Stone Age. Nobody had opened the graves, so there is no way that somebody stole all the skulls. They must have been buried this way. Mr. Sjogren said the team doesn't know whether it had something to do with a burial ritual or something even weirder. Too late, it's already weirder. The skeletons were also missing their thigh bones. Lots of hand bones, foot bones, teeth, ribs, but almost no larger bones were found. It's totally unique and highly unusual. Sjogren said normally when excavating megalith graves, it's the smaller hand and foot bones that are missing. There isn't any correlation between age, either. There are about 12 individuals, ranging from small infants to extremely elderly. These people were probably farmers and may have been related. I'm hoping that somebody finds the head soon so we can solve this grotesque mystery. A Legendary Roman Massacre Found Another grotesque mystery is in need of solving this one in the Netherlands. A team of scientists at the University of Amsterdam discovered evidence of an ancient massacre. It may have been perpetrated by soldiers with the Roman army. For years now, archaeologists have been finding random bones, rusted swords, and broken spearheads at a site in Kessel, not far from the German border. It's been obvious that there was some sort of conflict that happened here. There must have been a battle, but nobody knows which battle. But now they think they've figured it out. It was no battle, it was a slaughter. 
a slaughter perpetrated by none other than Julius Caesar. Let's go back in time more than 2,000 years. In 55 BC, the Roman Republic was in the middle of the Gallic Wars. At the forefront of the war was Caesar and his Roman legions. He ordered his troops to massacre two tribes that were giving the Romans a hard time. The way he did it has gone down in history as one of the most despicable acts of any Roman leader. The two Gallic tribes, the Tencteri and the Usipides, traveled from far in the east to meet with Caesar. They understood the might of Rome and that if they didn't capitulate, they would be destroyed. For the sake of their people and their survival, they went to Julius Caesar and begged to be spared. Caesar could have spared them. It would have been as easy as letting them go, but he didn't. He ordered his troops to slaughter them where they stood. Both tribes were erased from the historical records as if they never existed. This brutal episode in Roman history is well known among scholars, but archaeologists were never able to identify exactly where the massacre occurred. Now, scientists in Amsterdam think all the objects they've been finding are from that 55 BC massacre. What are your thoughts on Julius Caesar? Hell on Earth 101 years after they were killed, soldiers of the First World War have been found entombed in a German trench system. Experts involved in the discovery have described it as a glimpse into hell on earth. A total of 125 bodies were found, most of the men German, British, French, and South African. They were discovered exactly where they fell during some of the most intense fighting of World War I. Scratch that, some of the most intense fighting of any war that has ever been waged. I can't show you any photos of the skeletons as the organizers of the project have withheld all visual media out of respect for the dead. What I can tell you is that the trench was discovered on top of a hill in a small village in Belgium. The trench system had gotten covered up in the final days of World War I. Then it remained buried all these years until now. Archaeologists only found the trenches because in 2015, the area was about to be transformed into a housing development. Imagine learning your fancy new condo was built on the bones of World War I soldiers. Some of the skeletons have been traced back to soldiers no older than 15. Most of the dead were German, and most, if not all, were killed by bullets or shellfire during the First Battle of Ypres. This was in November of 1914. The Germans held this hill for years. It's known as Hill 80, first transformed into a German outpost in 1914. The Germans kept it until 1917 when it was captured by the British. Because the Germans were in control of the hill for so long, they dug a formidable series of tunnels underneath it. For many German soldiers, Hill 80 was home. They lived here for years, every day like living in the first circle of hell. There was constant gunfire, explosions, attacks, and counterattacks. It was a walking nightmare. The One-Legged General I'm going to say a series of words now that I guarantee you've never heard in your whole life. A DNA analysis was recently conducted on a one-legged skeleton discovered underneath a Russian dance floor. If you've heard that anywhere else, I'll be very surprised. It turned out the one-legged skeleton was a French general who got hit by a cannonball. And you didn't think things could get weirder. The general was part of the epic failed invasion of Russia in 1812, the one I told you about earlier. We are right back where we started with Napoleon Bonaparte and his botched conquests. But what was one of Napoleon's generals doing under a dance floor? Historian Pierre Malinowski led a team of French and Russian researchers in search of the general's remains in 2019. They wanted to find his corpse because Charles Etienne Goudon de la Sablonniere was an important person in Napoleon's life. Could you even fit that long of a name onto a driver's license these days? Napoleon and Goudon were friends in military school. When Napoleon became emperor, they remained best pals. But it's safe to say their relationship was stressed when Napoleon led his 600,000 soldiers to their deaths trying to capture Moscow. In August of 1812, during the Battle of Alutino near Smolensk, Goudon was hit with a cannonball. That must have been the worst experience. Goudon got hit so hard that his leg had to be amputated. Considering everyone was already starving, the French army wasn't in the best shape to take care of their wounded. Goudon's leg became gangrenous, and three days later, he was gone. But what about the dance floor? 
The general's remains were found underneath an outdoor dance floor in Smolensk Park. After he died, his own troops cut out his heart so that they could bring it back to France. They left his body behind in Smolensk because there was no way they could carry it. His heart was brought to the cemetery and his name was inscribed in the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Scientists know it's his body because the DNA from the skeleton was a 100% match with DNA from the skeletons of Goudon's mother and brother. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Parthian Tomb. In October 2020, officials announced the discovery of a 1,000 year old tomb in Iran's Kurdistan province. Inside the tomb was a human skeleton with a spearhead beneath its ribs. But perhaps the most unique thing about it is that it is inside a giant clay jar. The remains are thought to date back to sometime between 247 BC and 224 AD during the Parthian era. They appear to belong to a warrior who died from their injuries, as evidenced by the spearhead that probably got stuck inside when they died. Project leader Shoku Khosravi explained that in the Parthian burial tradition, giant jars usually played the role of coffins, and in the discovered tomb, according to the Parthian culture, the body was placed inside two earthen jars. Also known as the Arsacid Empire, the Parthian Empire was a major political and cultural power, extending from what is now northeastern Turkey to eastern Iran at its peak. The powerful civilization's religious beliefs, art, architecture, and other customs contained elements of Hellenistic and Persian cultures. The unique grave is actually one of several Parthian burials discovered throughout the country in recent years. In a sad turn of events, grave digging machinery in a northern Iranian village in May 2020 was making room for deceased COVID-19 victims when they uncovered an ancient grave. It contained ancient skeleton fragments and a host of artifacts dating back to the Parthian era, including a sword, dagger, quiver, and arrows. Ancient Counterfeit Currency Around 1200 BC, during a time period known as the Late Bronze Age Collapse, and several years before coin currency was invented, silver hoards were infused with cheaper copper alloys and coated with an authentic-looking layer of silver. In analyzing 35 silver hoards found throughout Israel, archaeologist Silla Eschel found that eight were debased in this manner. This early counterfeit currency came when kingdoms throughout the region, then known as Canaan, often met violent ends. At the time, Egypt ruled the area, leading researchers to believe that Egyptian rulers were originally behind the dirty money, perhaps to falsely bolster the quantity of their silver stores. Moreover, the stashes were imported because Canaan had no silver sources. Sometime between 1200 BC and 1150 BC, the silver trade abruptly ended. This coincided with the downfall of late Bronze Age kingdoms, and a shortage of the precious metal may have played a role in the trade's collapse. The main takeaway from the study? In the words of Eschel, counterfeiting continued after the Egyptians left Canaan, but they were probably the ones who initiated it. A constipated demise A new study details the painful demise of a mummified man who died sometime between 1,000 and 1,400 years ago after eating mostly grasshoppers for months. Found in the lower Pecos Canyon lands of Texas, the man had a condition called megacolon, when a person's colon swells up to six times its normal size. He suffered from Chagas disease, which prevented him from properly digesting food and led to malnourishment. Chagas is passed on by parasites. During the final two to three months of his life, he was likely unable to eat or walk on his own, and it appears as though his caretakers fed him grasshoppers with the legs removed the squishable part of the insects, in the words of University of Nebraska Lincoln professor Carl Reinhardt. In addition to being high in protein, it was pretty high in moisture, Reinhardt explained in a statement about the research, so it would have been easier for him to eat in the early stages of his megacolon experience. All of this means that someone was taking care of him, and researchers are calling this an early example of hospice care. The findings are the latest of numerous studies on the mummified man since his remains were discovered in 1937 in a rock shelter. More recent research found that his body contained food remains that he was unable to digest, as well as 2.6 pounds of feces, meaning that he was extremely constipated for months. The detailed results of the study will be published in spring 2021 in an upcoming book called The Handbook of Mummy Studies. If you want more info, be sure to check it out.
Nazi Enigma Machine Divers removing fishing nets from the Baltic Sea in northeastern Germany's Bay of Gelting for the World Wildlife Fund recently found a Nazi code-making machine called an Enigma Machine. At first glance, the diver who discovered the device thought it was a typewriter because that's pretty much what it looks like. Soon enough, however, the team realized that they had found something stranger. To keep Allied forces from learning about their plans during World War II, the German military used the Enigma machine to send coded messages. The keys did not actually correspond with the letter on them. Instead, they used anywhere between three to eight rotors to type out a series of different letters and symbols for any one key. Enigma machines with three rotors were used for German warships. Those with eight were for U-boats, which were responsible for sinking thousands of Allied ships throughout the war. The device that was recently discovered is the type that was used on warships. It's possible that the Nazis threw it overboard toward the war's end in a last-ditch attempt to keep the Allies from accessing it, according to John Vaught, a German Naval Association historian who spoke with the DPA news agency. Archaeologists are restoring the Enigma machine at a museum in the state of Schleswig-Holstein. Once they're finished, probably in about a year, it will go on display for all to see. Human Bone Weapons What do you make weapons out of when you don't have metal, stone, and bones? Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who once lived in Doggerland carved weapons from human bone. Because why not? Doggerland is now underwater in the North Sea, but it was once a land bridge between mainland Europe and the UK. As the region was gradually flooded by rising sea levels around 6,000 years ago, the nomadic people who lived and traveled through Doggerland left behind numerous artifacts that still occasionally turn up today. The recently published research analyzed 10 bone weapons originating from Doggerland. Eight of the artifacts, known as barbed points, were crafted from the bones of red deer, while two were made from human bones. Even the experts themselves were shocked by this discovery. We expected to find some deer, but humans? It wasn't even in my wildest dreams that there would be humans among them, lead researcher Joanne Decker told Life Science. It's a mystery why the prehistoric people of Doggerland chose to create weapons from human bones, which were harder to find and a less ideal material than deer antler. The barbed points were likely carved shortly after someone's death, according to Decker, because it would have been much easier than working with dry bone. There were probably cultural rules on what species to use for barbed points, Decker explained, adding, we think it was a conscious choice that had to do with the connotations and associations that people had with those deceased people as symbols. The barbed points were radiocarbon dated between 11,000 and 8,000 years ago. Knowledge is limited on how common it was for the Middle Stone Age people who lived in the area to craft weapons from human bones. But Decker's discovery provides a first step toward learning more about this practice. Baby in a Jar Archaeologists working in the ancient city of Jaffa in what is now Israel recently unearthed a jar containing the 3,800-year-old remains of a baby. Burials like these are not necessarily rare and have occurred over numerous time periods dating as far back as the Bronze Age and as recent as less than 100 years ago, according to Israel Antiquities Authority archaeologist Yoav Arbel who was part of the team that made the discovery. But experts have yet to figure out the reasoning behind these burials. Arbel told Life Science, you might go to the practical thing and say that the bodies were so fragile, maybe they felt the need to protect it from the environment, even though it is dead. But there is always the interpretation that the jar is almost like a womb. So basically, the idea is to return the baby back into Mother Earth, or into the symbolic protection of his mother. Jaffa makes up the older part of Israel's second most populated city, Tel Aviv. According to Arbel, it's been continuously occupied since 900 BC, making it one of the world's earliest port cities. Paid to go away After backing an unsuccessful candidate for emperor, residents of the Roman city Nicopolis ad Istrum, on the losing side, paid a hefty donation to the victor. This is according to a 2nd century Greek inscription on a limestone slab that archaeologists found while excavating the site in the early 20th century. The city, located in what is now Bulgaria, promptly sent 700,000 gold coins to Emperor Septimus Severus upon his victory. He gladly accepted the gift and responded with a letter that the town's grateful people turned into a 10-foot-tall, 3-foot-wide, 2-ton stone monument. Researchers recently restored the broken artifact. Nikolay Sharenkov, an assistant professor at Sofia University in Bulgaria, provided an updated translation of the inscription. 
in their letter to the people of Nicopolis ad Istrum, which is one of the few to survive the era, Severus and his son Caracalla told them that they accept their cash contribution. The letter also states that the people had taken the right side. Experts believe that the city gave this payment to Severus to prove to him that its people were trustworthy after they backed a losing candidate for emperor. The inscription backs up this idea, stating you have shown thereby that you are men of goodwill and loyalty and are anxious to have the better standing in our judgment of you. But the money exchange between Nicopolis at Istrum and Severus to get in the emperor's good graces is not the only shady thing that went on at the time. In his letter to the city, Severus falsely claimed to descend from Marcus Aurelius, presumably to bolster his perceived credentials. But the man's ancestors were actually from Africa in what is now Libya and were not related to Marcus Aurelius. So, as much as the donation benefited Nicopolis at Istrum, Severus also wrote it for his own gain by using it as an opportunity to legitimize his role as emperor. Win-win. Gardening treasure While weeding their garden in Hampshire in southeastern England in late 2020, a family found a buried stash of 15th-century gold coins featuring English monarchs. Altogether, the hoard contained 63 coins and one silver coin, which were minted over a roughly century-long span. They depict several kings, including Edward IV and Henry VIII. The coins of Henry VIII also contain the initials of any one of three of his wives, Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, or Jane Seymour. The reason for putting their initials on the coins is unknown, but the initials changed fairly frequently considering Henry VIII's many marriages. Another mystery surrounding the coins is why someone decided to bury them around 1540. In fact, nobody even knows if the person who buried the coins repeatedly visited the site to add to the stash or if they only went there once. But they were definitely wealthy, as the hoard has an estimated modern-day value of $18,600. That's much more than the average wage in Tudor times. The family who discovered the coins promptly contacted the British Museum, which has been kept quite busy amid the coronavirus pandemic as backyard discoveries have greatly increased. The museum's Portable Antiquities Scheme, or PAS, works with people who discover artifacts throughout the UK to ensure that the items are studied and documented. As much as at-home archaeological discoveries are on the rise during life in lockdown, this find is particularly special. A gold hoard this big or from this particular time is rare indeed. Germ-covered art Leonardo da Vinci is known as one of the greatest artists of all time. A new study of seven of his iconic drawings revealed that each piece of artwork harbors a unique collection of microbes. In fact, after making their initial findings, researchers were able to identify specific paintings based on this information alone. As unique as they were, the microbiomes among the paintings that were examined had enough in common for experts to sniff out counterfeit artwork or pieces that were stored differently. Da Vinci's drawings were found to contain a lot of human and insect DNA, fungi and microbes that cause paper to decay. Most surprising to the researchers was that the drawings contained a higher concentration of bacteria than fungi, while most drawings and other paper works of art tend to contain more fungi than bacteria. This is likely from the high number of people handling the drawings over the centuries and flies defecating on them. Simply put, many of the people, creatures, and environmental factors that came into contact with the artwork left an invisible trail on it. By studying the microscopic life forms that cover paper objects, researchers can potentially develop new ways to detect forgeries and learn more about a piece of artwork's history. There are possibly limits to how much these microbes can teach us, however. Although researchers believe the DNA dates back to restorers who handled the drawings during the 15th century, it is unclear how far back in time the microbiomes are left behind from. Scientists have yet to examine the DNA in detail, but those pieces of art are slowly beginning to talk. Ancient Egyptian Star Constellations Experts in Germany and Egypt who recently restored a 2,000-year-old Egyptian temple, called the Temple of Esna, found mentionings of previously unknown constellations and revealed the vibrant colors that the ancient structure was originally painted in before being covered in dirt and soot. It looks like it was painted yesterday, project leader Christian Leitz told Life Science. The restorers carefully cleaned the temple using alcohol and distilled water, revealing the detailed carvings depicting constellations such as the Big Dipper and Orion. They also found inscriptions referencing Apedu and Ra, or the geese of Ra, the Egyptian sun god. The constellations mentioned in the inscription were not drawn out, however, leaving experts to wonder what stars in the sky they refer to. 
The surviving vestibule at the Temple of Esna is all that's left of the several temples that once existed there. After being used to store cotton during the second half of the 19th century, it was left neglected and filthy. It was only recently that the intricate artwork, hidden beneath the layers of grime and bird droppings, was again revealed. Thanks for watching! Hope you learned something new today! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you soon! Bye!